Welcome, everybody. My name is Michael Liendo. On stage with me, I have Breeze Pillay. He's going to introduce himself in just a moment. But just to make sure you're in the right spot, I see some folks coming in at the moment perfectly fine. This is going to be what's new with AWS AppSync for enterprise API developers. A quick show of hands. Who's used AppSync before? OK, nice. We got an awesome mix. And if you didn't raise your hand, that's perfectly OK. You're in the right spot because we're going to be covering a lot of that. We're also going to be introducing some really cool things, such as generative AI, how do you build full stack applications with AppSync, and, uh, and a couple hidden gems along the way. So it's going to be a lot of fun. You can follow us online. I'm pretty much everywhere. I'm a senior developer advocate over at AWS. My partner, Breeze, up here is a solutions architect, super smart guy. You're going to hear more from him in just a moment. But I do want to go ahead and start getting into these slides. Uh, but just to give you sort of the quick rundown on what we're going to be talking about today. Okay. What is AWS AppSync, right? We saw half of the group sort of raise their hands, and the other half maybe not so familiar. And that's perfectly fine, because we're going to be covering just that. We're going to be talking about how it's built for developers. And I do want to emphasize it's built for all developers, full stack, back end. Uh, if you are using CD and you're a DevOps person, like there's a little bit of AppSync for everybody. And hopefully you find that as we take um, some of those notes away from our session today. Now, built for databases, but I'm going to throw a little, a little asterisk there, OK? When we talk about enterprise applications and AppSync, it 100% is built for databases. It's built for developers. It's built for devices. I mean, there's just like the trifecta there. But the key point that you want to take away is that it's built for data sources. AppSync is really great. GraphQL is really great at connecting to various data sources. So I do want to plant that seed that when we talk about databases, it doesn't have to be databases. And you'll see what I mean in just a moment. Now, we are going to cover event-driven, API-driven application development. It's all the rage these days. If you have a microservice, that's great. But how do you connect that to your other microservices? How do you get your data from one application to another? Again, AppSync is going to be really great at that as well. And of course, because this is reInvent and this is 2023, generative AI is going to be in the mix. Uh, there's really no escaping it this time. All right, so let's go ahead and chat a little bit about what is AWS AppSync, how that relates to GraphQL. Really what we're talking about is a fully managed serverless offering from AWS. AppSync is going to give you a way for your front-end applications to connect to your back-end infrastructure. And recall that I mentioned it not just being databases. You can connect to DynamoDB. Uh, you can connect to, I don't want to take any spoilers away, but RDS instances. We also have HTTP APIs. And I do have a couple of demos early, uh, later on in this session where we are going to be integrating directly with AWS services without the need for an intermediary Lambda function. Now, when we talk about being fully managed, when we talk about it being serverless, really we're trying to minimize the amount of code that we're writing. Now, I don't know about all of you, but anytime I have to write code, it's like the world is just that much more dangerous. Right? I prefer when the service writes the code for me so that way I don't have to manage it. I don't have to do any upkeep with it. Once it's set, it's, it's set. And I can trust that it's going to stay that way because I don't need to worry about patching or updating or things of that nature. Security and performance comes out of the box. When we talk about truly serverless applications, as you scale up, your application is going to scale up with you. As your users uh, have a big event and you need WebSockets and you have a bunch of requests hitting your application, AppSync is going to scale to meet those needs. Security comes in many forms. We have Cognito in place. Uh, we also have your custom OIDC providers there as well. And it integrates naturally with those. And again, we're talking about a fully managed, dedicated service that is doing all of this. You don't have to wire it up. Uh, but there is that option if you wanted a truly custom flow as well. So that's really what we're talking about here, AppSync being a fully managed, dedicated service. But how does it relate to GraphQL? Show of hands, who's familiar with GraphQL? Oh, more hands than before. Perfect. Yeah, AWS has a fully managed solution. So you don't have to set up an instance to host your GraphQL server. This is all taken care of for you. Now, a lot of you know, because you just raised your hands, that we're talking about a schema-driven development 
right? You have your types, you have that security in place where you can see exactly how your application is going to be structured because you told it so. You have ints and strings and custom queries and all that nature. Now, the resolvers, though, are where it gets interesting. This actually came out last year, but I do want to make sure I resurface it because of the folks that are new to AppSync in particular. But there used to be this thing from Apache, it was called Velocity Template Language, and it wasn't the most friendly thing to write. So a lot of our customers said, you know what, I'm just going to use a Lambda function. Maybe I don't care so much about those cold starts from a Lambda function, or maybe I don't mind that now I have to manage this code myself, my custom business logic, because the Lambda function gave me an easy way to get uh, my business logic out of my application. We listened, and what we ended up delivering were JavaScript and TypeScript resolvers. TypeScript through the use of a uh, build runtime, but then you can transpile that down to regular JavaScript, which is what AppSync accepts. So you have these really cool resolvers that end up looking like Lambda functions. And again, you'll see some examples of that, but at the end of the day, they're really just a layer, or an abstraction, over VTL so that you don't have to write that. We manage all of that for you. Now, with that in mind, I do want to go ahead and hand it over to Brees. We're going to talk about how it's built for developers. Awesome. Let me see if this one works. Um, so hey, folks. My name is Brice Pele, and I'm a principal product manager for AWS AppSync. Really excited to be here, and I'm super excited to uh, tag team this session with Michael. So we talked about AppSync, and we really believe that AppSync is the best way to connect your APIs, to connect your clients to data. And to do that, we really want to focus on the developer experience. So as Michael talked about, last year, we released support for JavaScript resolvers. And this was a step function level improvement um, to the developer experience. Really allowed developers to really start implementing business logic to directly access data sources from their resolvers. We then followed that up this year with TypeScript. And what I mean here is that we made sure that developers could use TypeScript from their local environment and that the compilation result from those TypeScript functions would work with AppSync. We also introduced supports for source maps so you would get a better logging improvements, and I'll show you what that looks like. And we worked on introducing more support for things like array functions and arrow functions so that you could do more in your code, more um, looping, more transforming, more mapping of your function. We essentially just wanted to enable everybody to be able to do more directly in their code. And then last but not least, we definitely wanted to address this, and this year we released support for unit resolvers. Um, so you can now use JavaScript not only to write your pipeline resolvers and your pipeline functions, but for those situations where you need to do a single data source access, you can use unit resolvers. So let's talk about resolvers. How does the development process typically work if you're gonna use something like JavaScript resolvers? Well, in a resolver, you have what we call a request and response handler. The request handler is responsible for telling AppSync how to interact with the data source. You're gonna make a request to your data source, and then your data source is gonna respond back with some data, with a response. That's where the response handler comes in. You write your response handler to handle that data and then to format the data in a shape that's super suitable for your client response. Now, we talked about TypeScript, and that's all optional. You can use it if you want to or, or don't use it, right? Um, but the cool thing about using uh, TypeScript and having local support, local development support, is that you can actually start using your own modules, your own custom libraries. So JavaScript Resolvers does, does not support importing NPM libraries, but it doesn't stop you from writing your own libraries that you can use over and over again and modularize your code. All you need to do is import your libraries and then use a tool like ESBuild to bundle your code and then get the result of that bundling, that bundling step and use that to update your resolvers. So what does that look like? Well, we've been talking about Gen AI, we've been talking about Bedrock. So let's take, imagine the scenario where you are building your next great, great Gen AI application and you want to pr present a simple API to your client that exposes some Gen AI capabilities. To do this, you're going to write a resolver. And because you know that you are going to use this type of bedrock functionality over and over, you, over, and over again, you write a utility for it. 
So in my resolver, I simply import my invoke function and a transform function that I'm going to use to process my uh, bedrock request. Then in my request handler, I simply call this invoke function, specify the model that I want to use. Here I'm using entropic uh, Claude v2 model, and I pass the instruction that I received from my client. Then in the response, I use a custom transform function to transform the response that I get back from bedrock. So one thing to remember, with Gen AI, a lot of time, what you're getting back from these LLMs is just pure text. But you may want to transform that into something that's more suitable for your clients. So you can do this here. Now, the benefit of this is that you can let AppSync deal with all of the complexities that comes with calling an AWS service. So here, all I'm doing, really, is letting AppSync make the request to Bedrock. And AppSync can sign my request for me using IAM permissions that I've configured on my data source. So you don't have to worry about configuring all of that in your client. You can do it directly in AppSync. Then with source maps, you get improved logging experience. So you can use a tool like ESBuild to bundle your code and include a source map in your resolver file. When AppSync sees that the source map has been included, it will automatically point to the initial location of the source code where something like a, a, a line of code was logged, was emitted in um, something like console.log. And if you run into runtime errors that we catch, we will also tell you specifically where in the source code the error occurred. So including this source map in your resolvers actually um, makes for a much better experience when dealing with CloudWatch logs and when dealing with runtime errors. The other thing that we released this year, and I'm actually, actually interested to see if um, people know about this, we released a new DynamoDB module for JavaScript resolvers to help developers easily and simply interact with DynamoDB. Just a quick show of hand. Has anybody used this DynamoDB util? Anybody heard about this? Not a lot of hands. OK, that's interesting. Well, the reason we did this is we wanted to make it easier for everybody to interact with DynamoDB. So developers on AWS love DynamoDB. And DynamoDB is heavily used with AppSync. It's one of the most used data sources with AppSync. The thing about DynamoDB is that it's really hard to interact with, like if you think about the native DynamoDB syntax. So we just wanted to make things easier in your JavaScript resolver. So take, for example, what I'm doing here. I have an update to do mutation that updates an item in a DynamoDB table. So how do I write a resolver to do this? I have my request, and I want to make sure that I can update a to-do with a specific ID. And when I make this update, I want to increment a version attribute that lives in my table. To do this, I'm not sure how I would do it with the native syntax, but I can easily do it with my DynamoDB utility. I just add a version to my values and use my dynamodb.operations.increment function to specify that I want to increment the version when I do the update. It's also really easy to write a condition. Here, I simply specify that when I make the update, I want to make sure that the ID that I'm specifying actually exists in my table. This ensures that when I make the update operation, it's only going to update the item if it already exists, right? It's not going to create a new item if it's not there. And then that's it. I call that dynamodb.update, specify the key, specify the values, and specify the condition. A lot simpler than doing it in the native way. We also introduced support for DynamoDB projections. So DynamoDB is a NoSQL database. And the items in your DynamoDB tables are composed of any number of attributes. And you can greatly improve the imp performance of your read operations by specifying the attributes that you want to get back uh, with your query scans and get operations. This is super easy to do with DynamoDB mo the DynamoDB module. Just pass it an array of projections. And your, projection, your array of projection is uh, made up of uh, attribute paths. So here what I'm doing, in my request handler, I'm simply getting the selection set list, which is an array of the fields that I want to get back as part of my query. And I replace this a forward slash with a dot. This creates a valid attribute path. Then I simply pass a projection to the get operation. 
And this ensures that I'm only going to get the fields that I need to get back from DynamoDB. If you haven't tried it, you should. should. This could um, greatly enhance the performance uh, uh, of your DynamoDB requests. But the key thing here, you don't have to remember any uh, clunky syntax. It's really easy to, uh, to work with. The other thing that I really like about the DynamoDB module is that when you take that um, together with the JavaScript functionality, it becomes really easy to do things like queries. And when you look at doing things like working with single table design, where you have a single table where you store mul multiple type of, of data, it becomes really easy to retrieve um, that information. Here, for example, I have a table that's composed of a primary key that has, um, that has a primary key and a sort key. So it's a, it's a, it's a composite key. To fetch the data about this, inf um, the, the data that I want, I can use my DynamoDB module and just do query, specify that I want to get all of the items that matches the primary key, and then specify that I want to get all of the items where the secondary key begins with a specific value. And then when I get that data back in my response, because I'm using JavaScript, it is very easy for me to extract the data that I want. I know that my data is returned in a specific order, so I know that the first item in my list of, of results is going to be my course, and I know that all the other items are going to be the registration information that is associated with my course. Super easy to do with DynamoDB, the DynamoDB module and JavaScript. So what we kind of highlighted here is that you can actually do a lot of things with the JavaScript resolvers, especially if you're doing accessing things like DynamoDB or you know, trying to make some simple direct access uh, implement some simple direct access business logic. So when should you use it? As I mentioned, when you have direct data source access that you want to do, if you want to interact with DynamoDB, for example, or if you want to access an HTTP endpoint, or if you want to interact with an AWS service, when you want to do simple data transformation, and when you want to implement an <coughs> authorization step before accessing some more data. The cool thing about this is that if you have a very complex or more complex use case, you can always fall back to using a Lambda function. There's nothing stopping you from doing that. We have great in, um, integration with Lambda functions as well. You can do a direct Lambda access and you can also do batching with Lambda, which is really efficient. So these are some of the benefits of using JavaScript resolvers. And so now that I've said that, I'm gonna hand it back over to Michael to show you a demo and to go, kind of go over some of the benefits um, of using um, AppSync with JavaScript resolvers. Awesome, thanks, Breeze. I'm gonna switch over to the computer screen. Oh, press that. Perhaps. Demo, demo. It's always with the demos. It's always the demos. <laughs> there we go, there we go. Um, I do wanna stress, we are not saying that we're anti-Lambda. I love Lambda functions. In fact, what we're saying is we're pro using the right tool for the job, right? Yeah. There's a way to use a Lambda function. There's a way to use uh, and connect to your data sources without using a Lambda function. And that's really what we want to get you to understand is oftentimes you're making simple requests or even some complex requests, as Brees was showing, but we give you libraries and tools to make that process a lot easier. Okay. Um, oh, I'm on. Oh, I'm good, I'm good. So what I'm gonna do is take my mouse, and now I gotta kinda do this weird thing, but um, I'm gonna go ahead and put in my email address, and I'm gonna sign into this application, right? And what I'm gonna be demonstrating is um, authenticating with Cognito. AppSync has a direct tie-in with Amazon Cognito. So we can build applications where AppSync serves as our API, it connects to our data sources, and then um, has a direct integration, as I mentioned, by the, via the schema to uh, provide your access patterns to Amazon Cognito. So I have a user here. This user has the ability to upload a photo, nothing too crazy. Uh, what's really cool is that this photo is gonna be uploaded to Amazon S3, I'm going to receive that key back, and I'm storing that key on my API. My schema is notified that it has an image ID. Now, what I'm doing here, though, is actually pretty interesting. When I click on Submit, that photo that I'm going to upload, this receipt, this is an expense report, is then going to be handed over to Amazon Textract, and all the expense details are going to be extracted from that. From there, I can persist it into DynamoDB. Now, those are two 
operations happening. Once I have that image key, I'm then going to go to Textract. Textract is going to do its thing. And then once that response is completed, I'm going to save those details inside of DynamoDB, again, using those uh, utilities that Brees was just talking about. What I love about this is that if you use the QR code uh, to scan the demo, you have access to all of this code. And you have the instruction on how to deploy this, modify it, and do all that fun stuff. Uh, but let's go ahead and choose a image here. So there it is, it just got uploaded, and if there's any luck without me having to do anything, all those details ended up coming back. And it's actually really fast, and the reason for that is because I don't have to worry about cold starts. It's going, it's already in the cloud, right? All of our infrastructure is in the cloud. So I have Absent going directly to rec or Textract, and then Textract going directly to DynamoDB. It's a really fast and efficient way of handling this. And then of course, this is all persisted, as you can see down below. I have my receipt details. Um, so this is persistent inside of a database, making it really easy. And again, if you scan the QR code, uh, you have all this information available to you. And if you did miss that QR code, uh, we have a couple more demos. There's gonna be a QR code on each of those slides, so that way you can have access to it uh, from there as well. Switch things back over for us. Okay. So this is, and this is the QR code, right? Yes. Awesome, so if you wanna scan that, and if you want to try his app, and I always say, if you want to try to break his app too. <laughs> like that. Said, any code that I write. <laughs> <laughs> but this is pretty cool, right? So this, that was a demo. You were using AppSync, going straight to TextRack, going yeah. straight to DynamoDB. No additional compute involved. That's one of the powers of using um, DynamoDB uh, AppSync um, with uh, JavaScript resolvers. Super efficient. OK. so. We talked about the fact that we have AppSync. It's great for interact with, uh, uh, great for uh, accessing data. Um, it's great with JavaScript resolvers. It's great with DynamoDB, which is a NoSQL database. Um, but it's also built for databases. And here I'm talking really about relational databases. So earlier this week, we announced enhanced support for. Um, databases that are running on Aurora with uh, the Amazon RDS Data API. So let me explain a little bit of what's going on here. Uh, AppSync supports today um, Amazon Aurora. So if you've got a MySQL or Postgres database that is running on Amazon Aurora, you can um, directly connect to your database using AppSync. No additional compute involved. Um, this is a direct connection uh, from AppSync to Amazon Aurora. But this week, we released a set of capabilities that makes it even easier to work with Aurora when you're using AppSync. We've released a um, new capability into AWS Console that allows you to create a brand new API from your existing database in a couple of clicks, and really in a couple of minutes, from the AWS Console. We've released a couple of new utilities for your JavaScript resolvers that makes it even easier to write SQL statements and to interact with your database. And then we've released a new introspection API that you can use to automatically introspect your database and discover types um, that map to your database tables. So the main thing here is that you can use AppSync as a database, as a backend database API for your front end. What that really means is that you don't have to expose your database directly to your front-end application and even to your back-end clients. You typically don't actually want to do that. You can leverage AppSync as a middleware layer to abstract all of that complex business logic that comes with accessing your database. And then at the end of the day, you can craft an API that is purposefully suited for your applications and for your clients. You can leverage all of AppSync's existing functionality that you expose at your client. For example, using um, one of our many authorization uh, modes like Cognito, OIDC, uh, Lambda authorizers, or API keys. And then you can use additional features alongside with that, like caching. So if you want to reduce um, the load on your database, you can use caching at the AppSync layer to make things even faster. And then, of course, you can connect to your database, but as we showed earlier, you can use a single AppSync API to connect to multiple data sources. So you can always enrich your, the data from your database with information that you gather from other data sources. And the cool thing here is that you do all this in a single request from your client. 
Then you take that single request and you map that out to all of the different data sources that you want to interact with. So one of the things that we looked at uh, when it comes to building APIs um, that connect to databases is that this can be a pretty long and error-prone process, right? You need to have a reliable way of creating an API that faithfully represents the shape of the uh, tables that are in your database. And typically, this is done with something that we call introspection. So we've added new functionality that allows you to do that inside and outside of the console. But this works in a very simple way. If you go to the Apps in Console today, you can start creating your API and select um, cre uh, and, and choose to get started from an existing um, Amazon Aurora database. Simply provide the information about your database, the ARN, uh, and specify the database um, that you want to that you want AppSync to introspect from within your cluster. In a couple of seconds, AppSync identifies all of the tables that exist in your database and presents you with options, um, uh, with uh, types that are mapped to those uh, tables. You can rename to types. So a lot of times in existing uh, databases, legacy databases, you'll have tables that have kind of funky names. So if you want to take those tables and create types with different names, you can do that directly as part of the wizard that we provide. You can also choose to exclude specific tables and specific types from your API. So this is another key thing. A lot of times you don't want to expose every single thing that is in your database, right? So you can choose to remove um, tables and types that you don't want to expose in your client. You can preview your schema at any time to see what we're about to generate, and you can choose whether or not you want to create a read-only API so an API that is only composed of queries, or if you want to create an API that has queries, mutations, and subscriptions. So here you see, you can preview your schema, and we show you exactly what we built from what we discovered in your database. And then in a matter of minutes, I think literally when I try this most of the time, it takes me less than a minute, you have a fully operational ready-to-use API. So you have something that you can start using right away and you can start adding additional AppSync features to it um, to use it in your own uh, application. And this is a feature that is available today and that will work with uh, Amazon Aurora Serverless configured with the Data API. And I'll say that coming soon, you will be able to use this functionality with additional Amazon Aurora configurations, like Aurora Serverless V2, and some provision versions of Aurora with Postgres. So how does this work? Well, what I showed you is what happens into console, but this is something that you can do outside of the console as well. We essentially introduced two new APIs. One is called Start Data, um, Data Source Introspection. This is the API that you call um, on AppSync. You specify your database information, and AppSync will connect to your database and find out all of the information about your types, discover primary keys, discover indexes, discover enums, and return all of that information back to you when you call to get data source introspection. This will return you all of the type information, and will, it will even provide you um, SDL for all of the types that we discovered. So you can take that information right away and create a schema yourself. Into console, we go one step further and create all of the resolvers um, for your queries and mutations. Now, I talked about using AppSync to abstract your backend data logic. But this is not always the case, right? There's a lot of situations out there in the wild, like I put here, where you have um, applications or clients that are directly accessing um, databases. Um, which is pretty dangerous when you think about it. Is everybody here, um, anybody here familiar with uh, Little Bobby Tables? Show of hands, anybody heard of him? Little Bobby Tables? Y'all should, should, should look up Little Bobby Tables. Um, <laughs> it's an X XKCD joke, look up Little Bobby Tables, it's about SQL injection. But SQL injection is a real, uh, SQL injection attacks are a real thing. And they happen when you allow dynamic data and dynamic values to modify uh, statically provided um, SQL statements and make them way, work in ways that were not intended. So the example here is that I've got a very simple, you know, kind of straightforward query that says select um, all from users where user ID equals the parameter. 
And it seems like this is totally fine. But if I allow any dynamic values to be passed to, uh, into this statement, this can actually change the intent of my initial um, um, SQL statement and cause for things that I did not intend to happen to happen, like dropping my students table. This is something we want to avoid. So in the JavaScript community, um, what we've seen happen over the last couple of years is using um, JavaScript uh, uh, tag templates to ad address some of this issue. And this is something that we're not make now making available in your JavaScript resolvers as well. You can use what we call a SQL tag template to write a static SQL statement. And we will use the result of that SQL stack take a template to create a SQL fragment that you can use to create a SQL statement. The great thing about this is that this is actually safe because it is a static statement that cannot be modified at runtime. The only way you can pass dynamic values to the statement is by using a template expression. And we will automatically take the values that you pass to that expression and send it to the database as a parameter using a placeholder. So what is happening here is that when this is run at runtime, the value that is passed by ctx.args.lat is actually passed as a per, uh, replaced by a placeholder and sent to the database as a parameter. So we are actually going to use the database engine to do the heavy lifting here and properly handle dynamic values. So this allows you to write your SQL statement in a way that feels natural and to write them directly in your resolvers. Now, a lot of times, um, this is great. You can write your static statements. But we can do even better. We can use ex new utilities that we provide as part of our RDS module that we introduced earlier this week to, to programmatically write SQL statements. So a lot of times, we just want to interact with our database and get data from our database. And you can do this by using some of the functions that we now provide. So the example here is that I'm, we're using a select function in our TypeScript resolver to fetch uh, rows of data from our messages table. And so what is going to happen here is that I can specify my table, specify my columns, I can specify my where condition, my limit, my offset, and how I want to order my results. And this automatically creates the statement um, that is going to be sent to my Aurora database. We automatically take all of your entities, your column entities, table entities, schema entities, and properly escape and quote them. And then we take all of the dynamic values and replace them by placeholders, with, replace them with placeholders. And again, we send dynamic values directly to the database and let the database engine do what it does best. So even if you are not a SQL expert, this makes things easier and um, easier to work with. You can do the same thing for an insert. Here, I'm writing uh, an insert statement, and I'm going to create a Postgres, Postgres statement. So I specify the table. It's, I want to insert something in my users table, specify my values. I can get my values directly from my GraphQL operation. Because again, we are going to take all of that uh, data and send it and um, handle it properly. And because I'm using Postgres, I can use the returning statement and say that I want to get back my, an ID, a name, and create it at. And so the same thing happens here. We take all of the properties of the objects and we map the property names to the columns. We escape them and quote them properly. And we take the values and we pass them, we place them with placeholders. So now I guess you, I, I think you kind of see how this works. We can do the same thing with an update. Uh, and in this example, I'm working with a MySQL database, so I'm writing a MySQL statement. But the same thing applies. Um, want to get do an update in my messages table. I take the values from my input, and I specify my condition, that I want to update a row where the ID equals an ID that was passed into input. And because I'm working with MySQL, MySQL doesn't support the returning statement. But when you are working with AppSync and accessing an Aura database, uh, we let you send up to two statements at the same time. So with MySQL, I can do my update and at the same time specify that I want to get back the row that was just updated. 
So you don't have to make two calls from your clients. You don't have to use a pipeline resolver. We will do it directly in a single resolver. And then the same thing with delete. And as you can see here, when I use the create my SQL statement function, I can mix and match uh, whether I'm using a tag template, whether I'm using something that was constructed with my RDS utilities. Uh, I can even pass it a raw string. So you can use whichever method you want to create your statement. Now, this is functionality that we just released this week, so it's brand new. Um, definitely looking forward to uh, folks trying this out. Let us know what you think. Give us some feedback. I encourage you to write the blog where we go into a lot more detail about what the feature is about, how it works. Okay, I'm going to hand it over to Michael to talk about EDA. Awesome, thanks, Breeze. Thanks, Breeze. One thing that deserves a mention is that the client can send, speaking back on his slides, the client is now sending SQL statements from the front end to the API, to the back end, and it's all type saved. I don't know if you caught that or not, but those resolvers were written in TypeScript. Yep. So there's never, I mean, I'm a JavaScript developer, so I'm gonna be biased here. Uh, but as a JavaScript developer slash TypeScript developer, I think it's really cool that we can interact with all these tools. I'm not a SQL expert, but now I have a way to have IntelliSense help me out and interact with all those things. I'm a NoSQL person, uh, so this makes it more accessible to myself. Thanks, Breeze. Event-driven architecture, though, this is actually pretty cool. What a lot of folks would like to do is oftentimes have application one talk to application two, and there's oftentimes not an easy way to do that, or at least not a intuitive way of doing that. AppSync, once again, has a solution here where it directly integrates with Amazon EventBridge. So you can have a mobile application, and oftentimes think of a sort of delivery app where you have your restaurant saying, hey, driver, go ahead and make this order. And then the driver goes out, and as they're moving throughout the city to deliver a package, the consumer in a completely separate application is receiving real-time location updates, right? A lot of companies take advantage of that exact same architecture, that exact same flow, and this is really how you would do it on AWS. You would use something like AppSync because it has built-in queries, mutations, and subscriptions. When you integrate EventBridge into the mix, those events can be sent over to other applications. Another example, this is actually a closer depiction of what I was just saying. You have multiple front-end applications here, in this case, mobile apps, that are sending events through AppSync, and EvapSync is going to then take those events, set up a rule, and saying, hey, when we receive this type of event coming through, I can do essentially whatever I want. But in this case, we're going to fire off a Lambda function. Once again, I love Lambda functions and they're going to invoke AppSync on the back end. That's another cool aspect of AppSync is it can be invoked on the front end or the back, or the back end, and we have client-side utilities that will facilitate that, things like Amplify libraries that can help you on the client side, but then you can, of course, just invoke these within the context of a Lambda function. Now, when you do that, and you fire off a mutation saying, hey, some data has changed, what's going to happen is the subscription is now going to be invoked. And that's really the key part, where you have events flowing through that are triggering mutations, subscriptions are now listening to those, so you can integrate with things like Amazon Location Service to have real-time location data being sent throughout many applications. In fact, chat applications take advantage of this same scenario, where you can create a game, and within that game, you can oftentimes chat to many users, and when you do that and folks are scoring points, you wanna see those events in real time. AppSync, again, through the use of having queries and mutations, those are gonna be your HTTP protocols. They also use subscriptions, which are going to be your pure WebSocket protocols, your WSS. There isn't really too much to go ahead and say when it comes to event-driven applications. I'm much more of a visual learner myself. Uh, now, bear with me, because I am doing the dance with the multiple screens. But I do wanna go ahead and showcase what happens when we start to integrate event-driven applications. So, if the last dance was fun, I'm gonna bring up two screens this time and see where we can do that at. Uh, oh, that actually worked, great. And uh, so I have that one, and then I have one more. Come on, little fella. Oh, get in there. 
Okay, so I have a chat application. Now, again, I'm a visual learner. I love building out these applications to really showcase what's happening here. But this is a chat application with a twist. Now, if you have the QR code, you can absolutely build this and try it out yourself, but I have two separate users here. In fact, if I come over here, I have this user, myself, at Focus Otter, and then, uh, or I'm sorry, this user can send a message to this person, and then over here, you have another user, and they can send a message to this Gmail account. Same person, except, in this case, they don't speak the same language. On the right-hand side, what we're going to have is this person typing in English, and the other person is then going to receive that, link, that message in their preferred language. So imagine any popular chat application. It's global, it's distributed, your team is all over the world, except you don't all necessarily have to speak the same language. Let's test this out. Now to give you a showcase of what's happening here, we have AppSync going to Amazon Translate. Amazon Translate is then going to DynamoDB, and when that change happens, a subscription is invoked. Two separate clients here. Uh, this person is uh, Spanish, I believe. So I'm going to say, hola. Is that in? Oh, let me set up a conversation between these two folks. So we're going to call this, how about reInvent? Seems fine. Great, it just happened here, and this person doesn't quite see it yet, so I'm gonna refresh, and they can pull that data from DynamoDB, and now they have this reInvent channel that they can listen in on. Great. So there's reInvent, there's reInvent on this side. Oh my goodness, this is gonna get fun with my password manager. And we're gonna start talking to each other. I'm gonna select this user, this person can select this one, and now we can start messaging. When I say hola on this side, uh, presumably we get hello, and look how fast that is, right? We have a subscription being fired off. This is all real-time data happening. I swear, as a front-end developer, like real-time data is my favorite thing to do. Uh, but then on this side, a little bit tricky, uh, I can say, you know, hello, how are you? Uh, question mark? And as soon as I click send, watch how fast this is. Boom, and then boom. Translated in real time, right? Chat application, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and you can use this. This is applicable today. We have customers that are taking advantage of this currently, and it's just amazing to me that this is something that appeals to the masses. I chose to say English and Spanish, but Amazon Translate supports 22 different languages, so you can imagine the implications there. Anybody can go ahead and chat with this, uh, I guess, assuming that they're part of those 22 languages. But uh, let me go ahead and switch things over. We have one more demo. I'm a demo person myself. And so, Michael, did you, this works by sending to request to AppSync and then pushes out the subscription to all of the connected clients? Yeah, yeah. That's Currently, great. it works with, uh, so you notice that these two users, when they sign up, I guess I should make mention of how that's happening. It's pretty cool. Thank you, thank you. So when a user signs up here, this is through Cognito, and this really showcases the integration between Cognito and AppSync. Uh, when a user signs up, this is using the Amplify JavaScript libraries, they provide their information here. But you'll notice that there's this bottom portion that's like, hey, what is your preferred language, English or Spanish? And again, that's more laziness on my part. I could have included more languages here. But once they do that, a Lambda function gets fired off. That Lambda function populates a user DynamoDB table that AppSync can then consume from. Once they do that, really it's just a matter of taking that preferred language and sending that on the request, right? And Amazon Translate is going to intercept that as well as the text content and provide a real-time notification, storing the contents in DynamoDB as well. And like, as much as I just blabbered on about what the process is, you saw how fast it actually is when you do it in real life. Okay. So we had the expense tracker, and that used Amazon TextTract, and then we just showcased Amazon Translate, so there's kind of a theme here, right? 
Uh, using generative AI, or using AI in general with your applications is cool. That's the theme. But when we start to showcase new services, things like Amazon Bedrock, Bedrock you could again start to do really cool applications. Now, I'm not gonna go into the full Bedrock and AppSync discussion here because I am also speaking at uh, tomorrow, uh, FWM311, if you wanna get the full spiel on AppSync and generative AI. I have more demos to show off in that session. But let's go ahead and get sort of the, the basics out of the way. Using AppSync, you can connect directly to Bedrock. There's no, again, Lambda function involved here. AppSync can call internal AWS services, and as you've seen a couple times now, it's really fast. Now, I don't wanna say that there's never a use case for Lambda because that would dismiss most of my session tomorrow where we talk about asynchronously invoking Lambda functions, but for a lot of use cases, most of them, it's okay to work within the constraints of needing that request to come back within a certain amount of time. Now that's a synchronous request, right? AppSync going to Lambda, or I'm sorry, AppSync going to Amazon Bedrock. And then as I alluded to, there's also the ability to do AppSync to Lambda function, and that Lambda function then talks to Bedrock. Now, the key part here is that when you receive that response for Amazon Bedrock, now you wanna do that dance again. Now you wanna trigger the mutation, which in, then invokes a subscription, and now your clients get real-time data. Think of a scenario where you saw in that chat application, it happened really fast, right? But we've all used generative AI, at least most of us, I hope, by this point, and you know that sometimes it can take a while. Now, oftentimes, the solution to that is that you have to store that information inside of a database, basically fire this off asynchronously, right? Store it in a database, and then pull the database. Hey, is it done? Hey, is it done? Hey, is it done? With AppSync, you don't have to do that because you can get a real-time subscription whenever it's done. The key part is that when AppSync invokes a Lambda function, you want to do so asynchronously. Lambda functions can be invoked two types of ways. One that says, hey, I'm going to fire you off. Give me the response within a certain amount of time. The other way is sort of fire and forget. I'm going to invoke this Lambda function. I don't really care what it does. But in our case, it can go ahead and return a response immediately, do that backend processing and then respond whenever it's ready doing its thing. Think of a bedtime story, that's gonna be my demo tomorrow, where we have AppSync calling a Lambda function, but now we don't want it just text back. Now we want an image for the bedtime story. Now we want audio, because my kids love audio. And then we also want text for the story as well. That's gonna take a while. I can't work within the, the constraints of AppSync or any other API provider, right, because the web browser would oftentimes restrain us from doing so. I have to have an asynchronous invocation here. This is a tried and true architecture of how you would do that. Now we can get a little bit more involved here. Think of scenarios where you do have that chat application streaming a, a response back, but you have a conversation in place. I'm talking to an agent or some kind of uh, language model where I want it to remember what I said previously. Great, you've seen a couple examples now in these demos of how we can inject DynamoDB in the middle of an operation here. So it really is just a matter of saying, I'm going to send you a new message, and then from there, you can pull the existing conversation history, similar to a chat application, really. I don't know who this handsome devil is, but if you do wanna see a video that talks about exactly how to integrate AppSync with Bedrock, uh, there just happens to be a video out there where you can click on that QR code, and it would make me feel at least really nice inside if you just <laughs> lifted up your phone and pretended to scan it, because that's me. But with that said, I do wanna head off to my final demo here. Uh, this is going to be using Bedrock. Now this is going to be a direct integration, AppSync talking directly to Bedrock, but it is near and dear to my heart because it got me out of the doghouse with my wife once upon a time. Perfect, and then we'll go here. Now, my wife loves word searches. She's, that's, that's her thing. I'm a Sudoku guy, she's a word search woman, uh, but she does them too fast for my pocketbook to keep up. I always gotta buy her word searches. I was like, you know what, I'm just gonna build you an application where you can provide 
your own words. And that was great for a while, but then she got bored because she was typing in the words herself and it wasn't all that fun. It felt more like work. So I said, okay, we can do better, right? So I went up and I should probably increase this just a little bit. I said, you can print off your own word searches. And again, this is a really fun activity uh, to do with your family and you have that QR code to scan it. But we can give this word search a title. You know, we can call this, you know, reinvent. Uh, let's, get, let's get crazy. Let's do like 13 by 13. Now, if I add in word searches, items here, you know, we can generate one. I can say this is gonna be friends and then we can have app sync. Uh, other things in here, bedrock. We don't have to get too crazy with it, but I can generate this grid. Now when I generate, uh, we get, uh-oh, length of undefined. My demos were going so good until then. No, let's get this working though. Let's go ahead and bring this back. Um, what did I do? Let's give it a theme. Uh, we'll say reinvent one more time. Not 134, please no. Um, and then separated by comments. So let's say app sync, and then we could say bedrock. I don't know what I did last time to screw things up, but let's try this. Yay! Okay, uh, you get an Amazon gift card if you find app sync. No, I'm kidding, I don't have that power. But it's somewhere in here, right? Uh, and I can verify that the words are down here, and then for my wife's sake, I just go and I, I print them off and it just shows the word bank and uh, in the words, it's pretty fun. However, when I save those grid details, I can save those words for later on into DynamoDB, and that's, that's just fun to do. Now, when any time she wants to update the words, she can, only, she can add more to it, right? She can put 20 words in there, and she doesn't have to put all 20 next time, great. But how do we make it so that it can generate the words for us? Well, Introducing today this new feature that just launched was <laughs> me adding an input button. <laughs> and this time, we're going to get creative. Now, I have the prompt already in place. The prompt is saying, give me 10 random words, or 10 words themed based off of whatever the user puts inside of here. So this is tricky because I don't know what AI is gonna say. Uh, but let's go with, uh, how about serverless? Uh, if I can spell serverless. Uh, oh, this is a sentence, right? So serverless AWS offerings with AWS app sync and bedrock. Let's see what that gives us back. Uh, let's generate these words. Again, uh, this is going to head off to bedrock, presumably fire things off, and there we go. Right, app sync, lambda, dynamo DB, and without having to do anything else, I can generate this grid, and it's been updated with all of these new words right here at the bottom. I'll pause so you can try to find whatever words you're looking for. <laughs> yeah, round of applause, that was pretty good. <laughs> but it's a good time, and as I mentioned, you have the code to do all of this stuff and to run it, uh, in addition to the blog post that is coming out showing other architectures and other solutions, so that way you can take this and, again, make your own wives or, or significant others happy as well. I'm just trying to spread the love here. <laughs> uh, but with that, I'm gonna switch things back over to Brees. Brees is gonna talk about how AppSync is built for enterprise. Yeah, yeah the, the one thing I wanna say about the, the demo and the pattern that, that Michael showed is we're starting to see real customers use this pattern. First of all, today. I am a real customer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's why I'm impressed by the demo. Right? I was like, <laughs> I work in this space all the time and I'm always impressed by your demos and this was a pretty good one. But we're starting to see um, customers use this pattern, app sync uh, invoking bedrock, or app sync using Lambda and bedrock for those streaming um, scenarios. So that's, that's pretty amazing. Uh, it's still like early days in this space, but it's really amazing to see some of those use cases and implementations already emerge. Okay, so to wrap things up, like we talked about a lot of things, right? Um, and these, the, 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 the capabilities that we went over are all things that are really crucial for developers um, that want to build um, re reliable, secure, and sturdy um, APIs for their applications. In the enterprise space, there are additional sets of requirement um, as well, and these typically have to do with security, scale, observability. So this year, 
we wanted to make sure that we could address some of the main requirements that we have been seeing from our enterprise customers. And so we released a set of features, private APIs, merged APIs, and we also released recently improved metrics for subscriptions. So if you're not familiar with the private API feature, it's fairly straightforward. The private API feature allows you to create an API that is only accessible from within your VPC. This is actually a really important thing for a lot of customers that work in, um, in environments where everything has to happen in their VPC or everything has to go through their VPC. I know a lot of us work in a serverless way, right? And we don't want to see a VPC, we, want to, we don't want to touch a VPC, but for a lot of customers, this is a real thing and is really important. So we released this feature this year, and if you've used AWS Private Link, um, you already know how to use um, this, this feature. Simply, when you uh, create your API, specify that you want it to be private, and it will be available um, to use in your VPC only. We then released Merged API, which is our solution for a common problem in the GraphQL space, um, which is the federation problem. So the Merge API solution is a solution that really allows customers that have multiple source APIs to work in, in an independent fashion, but then to bring all of their source APIs together to create a single Merge API that they can then make available to their clients. So it's AppSync's take on solving the federation, the gateway problem that exists in the GraphQL space. And it enables teams to own parts of their graph and to develop their graphs, their, um, their APIs independently and at their own space, at, at their own pace. They can even use their own tools, work completely differently, but then they come together to, um, to form this merge API. Uh, come together to combine like Voltron, I, I like to say. <laughs> Reference from a, a guy born in the 80s. Um, so that is what, what it does. And our approach is a build time approach. So merged API works at build time. You create this merged API at build time, not at runtime. The difference here is that we resolve all of the conflicts once when you create the API. And then at, at runtime, when we actually process requests, there's no, multiple, there's no runtime routing that has to happen, right? We can call your resolvers directly and we can call your data source directly. There is not, there is not multiple hops that needs to be taken. So it makes for a much simpler configuration, which is simpler to understand and simpler to manage. And it also allows us to have um, full support for subscriptions right out of the box. This is something that is not always possible with a runtime approach. We're going to have a session, I think maybe tomorrow, that goes really deep into merged API, so I definitely encourage you to check that out, and I'll have some information uh, about that in the slide that's coming up. But merge API essentially it allows um, two different accounts, it can be in the same account, can be in separate accounts, to build their own APIs to build uh, their own, to provide their own schemas, and then they come together to combine the schemas. You can combine types, you can combine operations, um, you can use directives to specify which type and which API has a priority over other types. So uh, there are a lot of things that we do to actually um, work with things like conflicts, uh, resolve these conflicts at build time. You can use an automated process or an approval process to merge your APIs. And like I said, there's no dynamic routing. Everything happens directly in one hop with merged API. I do want to mention that while we are looking at our merged API solution to address this, we are also working with the open source community. We are working on the GraphQL Fusion spec that was started by the Chili Cream team at the Guild. Um, so they are working on an open source spec to address the federation problem, which I think is a really good initiative because there's been a lot of, um, you know, work, uh, different companies and different entities working in their own corner trying to make this happen. Last but not least, uh, we've got just a couple of seconds left. Um, we did introduce some new uh, real, uh, metrics for real-time subscriptions earlier, uh, maybe two weeks ago. So you have now more visibility into your subscription um, API. This is a precursor for something that we are going to do next year. We are going to, to increase 
the default quota for your um, request rate for your tokens. So today, if you use AppSync, the default request rate per second for your token is 2,000. Next year, that request rate will increase to 10,000. So you will be able to use AppSync at an even larger scale without requesting a quota increase. Um, we are also going to release some additional quotas just to give you more visibility into your subscription engine. Uh, for the vast majority of our customers, um, they, 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 will not, they will not see an impact. Most of our customers will fall underneath those quotas. But for customers that really want to scale up their, their APIs to a large scale, having these new metrics and having these new quotas will have, allow them to have better control over their APIs. So we talked about AppSync being built for developers, databases, EDA, Gen AI, Enterprise. Um, we essentially are looking for developers and customers to be able to do more easily with their AppSync APIs. The last thing I want to mention, as I said, is we have a lot of additional sessions going on today um, and tomorrow. So, um, you know, please feel free to uh, check out these sessions if you want to dive into some of these, if you really want to go deep into merged API, private APIs, uh, what Michael and our teams are doing with the Gen AI stuff as well. I think this is um, all we had. Um, I want to thank you for um, joining the session. I want to thank you for your interest in AppSync. If you've used AppSync, thank you very much. If you haven't used AppSync, I think now is a great opportunity to check it out. Um, have a good rest of your day and good rest of reInvent. We'll be around for questions. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you.